David was amazing. I man. did a lot of stuff with David Briggs. David almost got in a fist fight with Cropper one night in a bar. <laughs> Have you ever seen Cropper's hand? Cropper He's had big. the biggest freaking yeah. hand, like a ham hock. The big guy. Big fat hand. Like I always felt like if he'd have hit David, oh, man, that would have crushed his face. Yeah. Well, as long as we're talking about Neil, um, when you we're going to tour with Neil, with, with Booker T and the MGs, and you ask them to ask me to go out with you to kind of do, do like the first leg of the tour. Oh. I was sitting behind Cropper's amp watching you because I want to make sure that, you know, I was doing my thing on stage to make sure you didn't, like, break something. I remember when Neil would play, he was, he was so loud on the stage. Yeah. That I couldn't hear the drums. Yeah, I was like, "How how could it be that loud?" Because you see, you see him on stage with like some old tweed amps. Yeah, but there's but a chain that goes <laughs> all the way into the back. Right, and it's an amazing bunch of stuff back there. Right, the record I did with him just recently, uh, "Peace Trail," was uh, that was you know song wise that was so funny, and yet if you really give it a listen, you know he's he's Typical Neil, he's talking about it. You know, he's he's saying it. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem I had with that little record was that, uh, you know, with a lot of artists, you get uh, you want they're looking for the first take sometimes, and uh, so so a lot of times it will be the first take. Um, sometimes it'll be the rundown. That's rare, but that's but that's uh, that actually can happen uh, with Neil. A lot of times it's before the rundown. It's while he just sat down and played and you started with him just to see, you know, where you're at, to see what this song is about. And then you're going to do maybe like a little rehearsal or rundown before take one. And uh, with Neil, it's, that's it sometimes. And on that record, Several of those takes are like that. And Peace Trail itself was like that. And I thought, oh, my God. When I listened back, I, I thought, oh, no, the, the snares were off. And so I know people probably thought, well, that's because he he's trying to be cool or something. Or do something just, different. You know, play. Yeah, do something different. Take the snares off. No, that was a flat-out mistake. <laughs> I didn't know the snares were off, but we had already started. Right. And I couldn't get it on you know mm -hmm. is that plus i was playing a, a maraca stick and uh so but that's the take that's the one he liked it wasn't even a take it was it was pre-rundown mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's that's part of the beauty of neil mm -hmm. you just have to be ready you know for that kind of thing and uh it truly is about his performance because mm -hmm. if if everything else is really great and Neil is not happening, you know, or he's not happy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it makes no sense. Right. So when you are listening to a take of Neil's, that means that he was happy with with what he did. So you better be ready. <laughs> right. You better be. Hopefully, you're happy with your performance. Right. Um, one of my favorite things uh, with Neil was a song called "Words" that we did all the time, and and I have a version of it. It was uh, uh, my recording of that song that night with my dad. I went out before the show and I put it down on the edge of the stage in the front. So it got a lot of drums <laughs> and, uh, and it got the rest of the band and the vocal and everything, his guitar are not as present as they would be. Mm -hmm. But it was really amazing to hear that because for me, I mean, this is the drum part of this video, right? Mm -hmm. For me, mm -hmm. I have been told many times by different musicians that I've played with, they, uh, uh, in various reasons in the control room, maybe listening to a playback, like saying to me, uh, wow, Jimmy, they don't capture all the stuff you do. They should, if they were able to get all the little stuff that you do, it'd be amazing. I've been told that so many times that now I know that it's true. Mm -hmm. But in any case, 
that's what I love about this little track, this mm-hmm. one little particular track. You can hear that what I love more than anything is, first of all, Neil, we played it many times, but this one particular night, Neil tripped up in a couple of spots, but it was because he was going for some things that he, he normally doesn't. And it's fantastic to hear his guitar locked in with the, with the drums mm-hmm. and the bass and the rest of the, of the group and the singing. And then to hear the squeals, you hear squeals in the audience for certain little things. He hit a note mm-hmm. and you hear people go, wow, you know, or a little thing with the drums and the guitar together. And then you hear people squeal from way out in the audience. Mm-hmm. I just love that. That's yeah. the, that's the thing that when I hear that now, I, I, I think, I hope, and I pray that that's not lost for too many years because the trust factor for people wanting to get back together mm-hmm in large groups like that and listen to a, a great artist like somebody like Neil sure. uh, or whoever they're, they're, they're gone, they've gone to listen to, you know, there, there's something really special about that. For the, for the artist, it's amazing mm-hmm. to have that kind of love yeah. from a group of people paying attention to what you're doing and squealing with delight. Mm-hmm. Man, I mean... That's a very, very special thing. Let's let's talk about the Wilburys and and how S- surviving the Wilburys. Surviving the Wilburys. No, and let me t- tell you the the story that how I was kind of brought into that uh, circle. Uh, I was. I was actually getting a haircut, one of my yearly haircuts back in the day, and my pager went off, and it was you calling me, and uh, so I had to borrow the a phone at the at the barber shop, and you basically said, "Here's a phone number. Uh, it's Dave Stewart's house from the Eurythmics, and give them a call, and uh, we need you give me a list of the drums you wanted." And get them up there as soon as you can. So I called the number, and uh, an English voice answered the phone. And I figured, oh, you know, the English tend to like English people around them. I thought maybe it was one of Dave Stewart's assistants. So I went back to the shop, grabbed a van, and put the drums in it, and drove out there. So I pull up to the front door of the house and ring, ring the bell. And the door opens, and it's George Harrison. And, and this was the voice, the same voice that I've been hearing on the oh, phone. Oh, it was Georgia. It was Georgia's voice, and I was a little taken back. I was like, the door opens, and it's all of a sudden, it's it's George. He said, oh, "What are you doing here?" And <laughs> or why? He, well, he was like, he goes, uh, he goes, "Oh, you've got Jim's drums." I said, "I said, yeah." I said, "He goes, well, they're going to go follow this road back around. Uh, we're taking them up to the studio up up other part of the property, up past the tennis court." Mm-hmm. So. Uh, couldn't have been nicer. And he goes, he goes, uh, would you like a hand? Would you like a hand moving Jim's yeah, drums? That's George. Yeah. And I said, oh, come on, I mean, no, come on. I, I, I no, I don't know. He goes, he goes, he goes, come on, man. Don't treat me like some kind of a rock star. I'd, I'd be happy to help you move them. I said, I'll give you a holler if I need help. And I couldn't believe what a nice guy he was. He was just like George. That was my first time I, I had met him, and he was just like. It's, it couldn't have been. It couldn't have been a cooler experience. I don't know if it was the first day, but one of the days I came up, uh, I was behind a white van, and um, and uh, I was patient, you know. And then I started to get un- impatient, and I started thinking, "Oh, don't, you know, just relax." And then I got really pissed, and and then uh, I I kind of you know went around him. And um, as I went around, I saw, and it was Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it was still in his white van. Wow! And uh, that uh, that was funny to me. That that was something I never forget. You know. And then, uh, so then, one time that I'll never forget was walking up the driveway to the back studio. The studio was in the back mm-hmm. of the house, and and it, it was like a little like a little house. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, but they turned it into a studio, and so it had a front porch mm-hmm. and a little swing, and um, and I walked up, and I I was hearing like softly strumming guitars, and then I heard the voices, and as I got closer, I could see they were all sitting. Uh, three of them were on the swing, and two of them were were, were sitting on around the swing. And, I, and as I got closer, I said, it blew my mind. I got chills because I forgot what song it was, but it was one of the songs that I really loved. Mm-hmm. And and it was Roy Orbison mm-hmm. and George and Tom Petty right. and Bob and Jeff Lynn. And they were all together on that little porch and I said, oh, my God, why don't I carry a camera? Because a moment like that, man, would have, that would have just been the moment. But that's something I'll never forget. That was, that was incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the recording was, it was just like this recording. It was just fun, just fantastic, the playbacks and everything. Then uh, one, um, one song, one day, I'd been in the kitchen uh, getting something to drink from the refrigerator, and I, I remember seeing the uh, the refrigerator shelves, uh, you know, little spaces and what the hell they call it. The ah. <laughs> anyway, so they had some enchiladas mm-hmm. sitting in one section, and then they had uh, they had uh, uh, banana. I remember there's some bananas on another section. And different things. They had a carton of eggs mm-hmm. on on another section, and so I just, you know, being a drummer, I saw the little uh, thing, and so I scraped it with my fingers, you know, brrr, and and I thought, wow, that sounds good. And then I had to go get a drumstick. I so I got a black, and it wasn't a blast stick, but it was, it was you know, a little wooden dowel stick, you mm-hmm. know, a half brush, half stick. And so I was scraping it, and so then I started grooving with it. And then somebody came in and, and said, "Wow, we got to do that." I think it was Jeff Lynn said, "Let's let's let's overdub that." And so uh, uh, I ended up putting that on a track, and uh, that was that was just such great fun to uh, to actually be playing the. And and then I I was stopping and said, "Let me let me retune it," and I would move the eggs over here <laughs> and the enchiladas back a little further <laughs> and get a little more uh, vibe and. Uh, that was that was a treasure in my memory. Yeah, I I just the only thing that ever bothered me about the Wilburys deal was that uh, George decided that he didn't want to tour. Mm. Uh, he didn't. George never really told anybody. He just it, it the way I heard it was, uh, we're not we're not going to do the bu- uh, the uh, train tour. We were going to do a train tour. Hmm. It was just going to be so fantastic. We're going to make stops mm-hmm. and play for the people, and and uh, so would you be on the train? Playing? Yeah, we'd be living on the train. Wow, traveling across the United States. Well, that sounds like a oh, it was. Day. It sounded so fantastic to me. But George, George didn't want to do it. He he's the one that did. everybody thought that it was going to be Bob that said no. Right. Turned out Bob was into it. Bob loved that whole thing, that whole experience. I remember a time when you got a call from Bob Dylan to fly to Rome and Milan. Milan. And you basically were going there to fill in for the drummer because his hands were cramping up or something. Yeah. And you were going to fly in and play a show in front of, I remember it being a large crowd, like 50 or 100,000 people with no rehearsal. Yeah. And the fact that you weren't nervous about that or not you know, visibly nervous about that freaked me out because I've had like nightmares about that, about, <laughs> play, about playing in front of people and I don't know the song, you know? Oh yeah. Well, you know, with Bob, first of all, you do know the songs. But the only thing you don't know about Bob is his new arrangements. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they can be radically different. So you just have to pay attention for cues at that point. 
So uh, George didn't leave the tour right away. He he stayed mm -hmm. uh, and uh, was sitting behind me mm -hmm. uh, like a like a roadie would mm -hmm. uh, for the first show. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I I don't remember that I needed that, uh, but I may have. And if I had have needed it, it would have been good for him to be able to say, "No, this is a shuffle, shuffle this month." <laughs> but uh. <laughs> So you just basically improvised. You just heard the no, song. Yeah, I just, I just, but see, don't forget, it's, it's Bob. Mm -hmm. And Bob, Bob loves a good accident. Bob will rehearse beginnings and endings, mm -hmm. but he doesn't necessarily want you to have a good, perfect ending. Wow. He just doesn't like anything that's like that. It's like for some people, you know, who wear like holes in their jeans and stuff, all, you know, messed up and stuff, that... For some people, is like a fashion statement. For some people, they prefer that to look neat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, Bob, that's Bob. That's the way Bob is. Bob just doesn't like his music to be like perfectly uh, manicured. You know, he just right. doesn't want it. Right. And um, you said something when I first walked in today. You said, God, I, don't I, I feel, I, I get kind of nervous. I, I get jacked up you know before these things and i said well that's good you you should use that and i was going to tell you the story about what john said to me one time he said back to john lennon mm -hmm. uh we were in a, a limo uh coming back from the mike douglas show back to new york mm -hmm. and we had just done the mike douglas show mm -hmm. and jerry rubin was on the show wow you know activist very famous activist mm -hmm. and uh rennie davis so we're in the limo on the way back. We had Rennie Davis and Jerry Rubin with us. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the people had their own uh, cars. And Jerry is going like, oh, man, damn, God, I shouldn't have, man, I was talking, oh, no, I should, oh, why didn't I do it? I guess I, I shouldn't have taken that speed, damn it. And, uh, and so John said, man, you never ever before you go perform or 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 talk or anything like that you never have to take any kind of speed don't be snorting cocaine or or ramping yourself up use your natural body is going to be have nerves a certain amount of nerves use that and that will take you up over and i will never forget him saying that man Never forget him saying that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something that you need to know. You know, you you use your if you're nervous before a show, whether you're the singer, guitar player, whatever. Use those nerves. Mm -hmm. Don't try to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. You know, drink some whiskey and coke real quick. Mm -hmm. No, don't you know? Don't do that. Don't alter yourself. Yeah. Use that, man. Use that. That that's like a God given little gift there. You know, that's right. a, like you you're you're amped up now. Right. I mean, we, we've done a we've had a long a long run, and I I feel like I I I watch you play, and it takes you like maybe a minute or two to get to a point in a song as long as it's grooving as long as things working where it's like you're not there anymore. It's like it's flowing through you. Yeah, well, that's interesting you say that like that because I, well, Joe and I were just talking uh, yesterday about uh, about that, uh, about, you know, uh, feel. Whether you're a studio person or, or whoever you are, if you find yourself behind the drums and you're playing somebody's song, and especially if they're going to record it, um, you need to be conscious of the feel. Doesn't matter if you like if you can play uh, a lot of stuff and still make it feel great, then go for it. But the main thing is to make sure that you make it feel great. Mm -hmm. I think that the way you you make it feel right is by getting out of the way of it. Mm -hmm. And by getting out of the way of it, I mean taking yourself out of the of the picture. The more you are in your mind as you're playing the music, the less you're going to be able to, to get to that place. 
you have to be able to leave yourself, check yourself at the door or something at some point. Somehow, you, you need to be able to not think about you and what you're doing. You need to absorb yourself into the, uh, to the music and let the music guide you. Now, you know, that, that takes some experience. It takes mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. To, you have to be able to be in that situation a few times, you know, before that can really kick in. If you just find yourself in that situation suddenly and, uh, you know, and you, you haven't got a, a, a body of experience, the chances are you're going to be thinking about, oh, man, I'm, I'm here and I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I, I'm, I have to think of it like this and I have to. In other words, you're going to be thinking instead of playing. When I, I mean, I'm working with a lot of producers that would work with you or or Jeff or or somebody else, and they would say that they really liked your backbeat because it was the furthest back, and Jeff and Jeff's wasn't quite as far back, but it was still far back enough. And what what I'm wondering is, do you have control over where you put that backbeat, or is it more just a a function of how much coffee you have that day. Oh, I never drink coffee before I play mm-hmm. because it really does affect my heartbeat. That what I've learned over the years, there are people who I play with in the studio who I can manipulate the time and there are people that I can't. And increasingly, in this day and age, I can't do that as much because metric time is in the bone marrow. It's in the DNA now of people. Mm -hmm. Musicians, whether they're old musicians or young musicians, metric time, you know, click time, that has permeated our very being. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing, it's not a it's not a great feeling to be able to say because you don't really say this to yourself. It's you're feeling it like okay, back here, okay, up here a little bit. Now we go up here, and now we go back a little bit, and now we're at the chorus, so we're going up like this, and then we come back to the verse down here. You know, you that's oh my God, they're dragging and they're rushing, they're all over the freaking place. Metric time. Metric time is the enemy. I'll say this now as loudly as I can. <laughs> and they can say, oh, that old man, listen to him, you know, mm-hmm. talking about uh, the, that is the truth because I know it. I've lived it. First of all, you don't play to a click anymore in mm-hmm. the studio. I mean, I, people, you should never play to a click. If, you, if you're in a situation where you're, somebody says, okay, uh, all right, turn the click on. Yeah, yeah you got to just leave. Just forget about it. Now, playing to a pre-programmed track, something that has been programmed, that's gridded out. Mm-hmm. That's already that's that's clicked out. That's mm-hmm. that's a that's on the grid, as they say. Mm-hmm. So that's got a a, a a metric time thing, and that you can play to. And you can make that work. Obviously, that's the way most of the big hits are, are made. Uh, you know, they're bringing a drummer because they want the live drums, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and they'll mess with it till, it till it's good. So they have the sound of the drums, mm-hmm. and, and they've got their, uh, their, their playing to the track that's been, that's been uh, made to be just exactly the way they want it. And the more talented, the more gifted, the producer, the artist, the songwriting, all of that team is the better those pre-recorded tracks are going to be. Mm-hmm. They're going to be, you hear them all the time on the radio. They're fantastic. So some, a lot of my favorite records, most of my favorite records are done like that. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you have uh, a group of musicians and you're going to play live, mm-hmm. you're going to cut some tracks live, you cut those tracks live and you listen to each other. Mm-hmm. And then if you need to fix some little fender bender or something, mm-hmm. you fix that. Mm-hmm. And then they say, if somebody says, yeah, but we got to do it to a click because we want to edit later. 
Tom Dowd edited John Coltrane records with Elvin Jones playing, man. And they didn't play the click. Mm -hmm. you, you, you make your cuts where the vibe is. This is, this is the way I would describe that kind of stuff, is you go to the beach, you see the surf. Mm -hmm. The surf comes in and it goes out. Mm -hmm. And it never stops. Mm -hmm. It does it just, that's what it does all the time. But it changes every time. There's no set pattern for it. It doesn't go in and out. In and out. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, yeah. the wind when it blows, man. The wind sometimes is like you feel it rushing, and other times you just feel it gently on your skin. Everything in nature has its own movement. Think about a hundred people of the greatest musicians in the world playing in the finest orchestras in the world. L.A. Philharmonic is now one of the great orchestras in the world that, you know, it's it's finally like one of the great ones, really, mm -hmm. really maybe the, the great one. That would be debatable with some people, but Los Angeles Philharmonic, you have to be a monster player to play in that orchestra. And yet they have one guy and he's like a genius, pretty much of a genius guy, Dudamel. Mm -hmm. He stands up there and directs these people. And so they're playing all this amazing, beautiful, music man with the harmonics that are like so thick and deep and that that heal your body even it's so important that kind of music so amazing and yet it's all done with a conductor there's nothing that's like this mm -hmm. there's nothing in nature that's like this mm -hmm. so it, I, I have to make it understood that I'm not saying that this is wrong or it's ugly necessarily. It's, mm -hmm. it's a way to make records. Mm -hmm. And it's a proven way to make records. Mm -hmm. But do you want to make that kind of record? Or do you want to make a record where uh, you've got live musicians playing together? It's just, it's just like having, do you want a piece of strawberry pie or would you like a, a piece of carrot cake? Is there any wisdom that you'd like to put out there that, you know, something that you've learned through all your years of, of living that you'd like to put out there? This is what I would say. I would say whatever line of work you're in, remember... It's about people. You're not isolated in this thing. You're not exactly, uh, you know, in space making uh, uh, <clears throat> crystals or something. You're you're down here. You're 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 amongst people. You're amongst your your peers or, or people you've never met before. You uh, and you must really learn to to respect people because that's the way you will get respect. It's just an old uh, saying from the Bible, man. It's, it's from every kind of wisdom you can, every corner mm -hmm. uh, of uh, faith, you'll, you'll find this wisdom. And it's called sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. Put out good vibes. Bring your best to a situation. And that's generally what you're going to get back. Bring anything else, and you can expect that back, you know. So I think that's really the key. Realize that you need people. And, uh, and that's the way people will end up needing you. Awesome. Yeah. We've been, uh, been sitting talking long enough. Do you, you feel like playing the drums? No. No? No, I don't. Uh, Maybe another time. Then. That wasn't a part of the plan, was it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you do have them set up. Yeah. And um, I haven't played for five months, so I don't know. <laughs> you want me to embarrass myself, in other words, right? Uh, okay. I just want you All to right. have fun. Okay. Okay.